Welcome to ME328, Mechanical Systems Design. So I am presuming that each and every one of you is interested in designing and building things, which makes you an inventor. And so the primary areas that we deal with in mechanical engineering are we build machines that convert energy to work. So we create machines that convert energy to work. And the best example of that is a car. I show a Toyota Prius right there, which is a pretty interesting car because it has not only an internal combustion engine, but also an electric motor. It uses gasoline as a fuel and it uses battery to store electrical energy, which it also uses as a fuel. So that is an interesting system. The other thing that we commonly do is we do mechanical work to create energy. And the perfect example of that is a power plant. This is an example of coal-fired power plant, which is an incredibly polluting system. And we are slowly replacing all of those right now with more uh, energy efficient and less polluting systems. Now, when we talk about mechanical engineering, we will be developing the fundamental practice of designing machines and mechanisms. And oftentimes these are very complicated machines, but we break them down into components and we do them to meet customer specified requirements. So we design systems to meet customer specifications. So that's kind of an important thing to keep in mind when we do this. So the way to really get a handle on all of the aspects that go into design, we can consider something really simple. Let's just consider our common experience in designing a chair. And I want you to think a bit about what goes into designing a chair, because these sort of common experiences really get to the to the heart and soul of what engineering design is all about. A chair is designed to support the weight of a person at an elevated position above the floor. So when you look at a chair, it's designed to support the weight of a person, but we haven't specified what the weight of a person is. So the designer absolutely must do that. So when you are doing design, you really have to think about how high above the floor do we want it to be? So there's a dimension there that's really important. We have to consider the, the width and the length of that thing and we have to make sure it is strong enough to support the weight of an individual. So how much does an individual weigh? Well, you know that there is a huge range of weights for individuals. And so there will be some statistical distribution of the average weights of an individual. So we can plot the weights in one uh, axis and we can plot a probability of a, of a person weighing that amount on another, everyone's going to be above zero. And so we'll get some distribution. It may not be a normal distribution. And then we are going to have to make a decision about what weight we are actually going to design to. And so we have to uh, specify a max weight and we design it to support that max weight with some factors of safety. We also design this thing to be able to fit underneath the table. And so the height of the chair is important. So there are space constraints constraints and we have to support the, the weight of a person reliably. So since we have to support W, whatever we decide that W is, we have to make sure that all components uh, are strong enough so that they can support W. So that's going to give us a component strength requirement. But we're also going to have to think about how much does the chair deflect under the influence of the weight that's applied to the chair. And so there's an important deflection consideration as well. So if you think about those things for a minute, you'll realize that the strength requirement could be specified by a yield strength. The deflection requirement is going to be some delta. Well, it arises from the elastic modulus of the material. So that's an important consideration as well. But also, you have to be able to move it. So a person must move the chair, which means there is going to be a mass constraint. So you have to select the materials. The designer chooses the shape, cross sections, and the materials. So material selection is a very important part of all of this stuff. There's another thing that comes into play. That is, how much does it cost? Doesn't matter how good the chair is, if no one wants to pay for it, you aren't gonna sell any and that will be a failed product. So the other thing that's kind of important, if you think about a chair for a minute, I'm just gonna go ahead and sketch some chair, a seat, we're going to have some legs here and we're going to add some fancy shape to it right there. There are going to be some height restrictions on that and you're going to have to change the length of the components, call this one L1 and L2, so that the vertical distance is the same so that the chair is not wobbly. Nobody likes a wobbly chair. 
And so there are going to be certain tolerances, there will be dimensional tolerances that will affect the stability of the chair and that you have to consider those dimensional tolerances also when you're doing the design of the chair. When we look at this chair, we have to think for a minute about what sorts of things will cause failure. So the one thing that would cause failure is permanent deformation. If it permanently changes shape, then it will no longer function or meet the specifications it was originally designed to. And so that becomes a yield failure. In this class, we will denote the yield strength by the symbol SY. So SY becomes an important failure property to which we will design materials. What else could cause it to fail? Fracture. If something breaks, then it will fracture. Usually we measure fracture resistance using a parameter called K1C, which is the mode one fracture toughness of a material. And we will study that this quarter. So it is just like yield strength, just like yield strength, fracture toughness is a material property. The other thing that can cause failure is too much deformation. We usually indicate deformation by a deflection term, delta. What about uh, if the sample were to creep over time? So a slow change in dimensions with time. This is usually called creep. We will briefly talk about that this quarter as well. What about eventual failure, failure after repeated use? This is what's referred to as fatigue failure. And that is another important design parameter that we will study this quarter. When we design materials, we design with, when we design structures, that is, we design with failure failure in mind, using science to predict when failure will occur. So in all of these cases, whenever we are doing design, we have to account, we, we must account for unknowns. And by unknowns, I mean, really, I mean, how heavy is the person that was going to be sitting on the chair? How strong is the material? Do we have reliable information on how heavy the person is, how strong the material is? Do we have to statistical distributions in strength, which we're going to call the ultimate tensile strength of the material. We need to understand all of those variabilities so that we can design to prevent failure. And we usually do this. We usually do this by inserting design factors of safety into the design process. We will use the symbol N sub D to be a design factor of safety. And what we do is we define the design factor of safety by taking the ratio of some loss of function parameter to the design allowable. So you, the designer, choose the maximum parameter size you want. The loss of function parameter is a property of the system. You want the loss of function parameter to be greater than the design allowable so that the factor of safety is greater than one. Throughout this class, we will use computer-aided design, finite element analysis, Excel spreadsheets, hand calcs, all to help us properly choose design allowable loads that that will prevent failure from occurring in our particular systems. We will write code, we will write some code, we will run code, and we will benchmark that code against known answers so that we are confident that we have gotten the code correct.